Thank you, Pinchas, for your talk in which uh, birds were mentioned here and there. But uh, now uh, we go back to birds. And uh, Dr. Nir Sapir from the University of Haifa uh, will present himself. He's going to talk about uh, birds and climate. And this is actually um, part of his work in, before he became a member of Haifa University, first in Ben-Gurion University, and then uh, in Hebrew University, in both cases on things that related to birds and their flight. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, Yossi, and all. OK. <laughs> and all other who helped me uh, and, and bring these uh, ideas and, and presentation into this uh, nice audience here. Um, uh, my work, as uh, Uriel mentioned, it has been focused on uh, animal flight and, and bird migration. And I think it resonates quite well with many of the talks you heard today. And, and as a start, I would like to start with the very basic principles of flight. And my aim is to try and scale up from the very basic principles of uh, flight that are uh, manifested in these uh, uh, different forces on uh, flying birds into uh, the more um, widespread and, and um, spatially extended phenomena of bird migration, as you can see here. For example, in this uh, um, um, nice presentation from, from MoveBank, uh, this uh, bank of movement data that uh, um, summarized data from different species on bird migration. So you can see here that the, the date is the 1st of January. And uh, we are talking about Africa and then on Asia, different parts. And we can see here that most of the birds are still in Africa and in India, in southern uh, latitudes. And, and when the date proceeds, there are some movements toward the spring. And when springs arrive in February and March, birds start to move. And as they move northerly, into the uh, uh, breeding areas. Uh, they occupied land that were formerly covered by snow. And I think that this nice illustration um, really captures the essence of migration and why it is important on a global scale and why uh, different environmental conditions at different parts of the world are so important for the existence of this phenomenon. <clears throat> so, uh, from this uh, illustration, um, I would like to speak about the importance of bird migration. And you all know that bird migration involves the movement of birds, but not many of you are aware of the different consequences of uh, bird migration for uh, the spread of pathogens, for the movement of energy and toxin between different parts of the globe, and, of course, to the important role of migratory birds in different trophic effects as herbivory, predation, being both predators and prey at different systems around the world. So with this in mind, the general goal of my research work is to uh, better understand the causes of animal flight and bird migration in particular which may answer the question of why to fly, okay? Why to fly, why to move, how to fly, how to gain energy, store it, and use it, how to fly in the sense of determining the actual path of flight, and what are the consequences on populations and ecosystems in the wild and on human lives. So, I'm interested to enhance the understanding of the phenomenon and the implications on mankind. And I will start with uh, uh, this example. I will show several examples. And this example is from my PhD at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. 
um, in which I studied uh, bee eater, Shrakrak Matsui. Uh, as you can see here, this bee eater is equipped with a ring, but it also equipped with a, a telemetry um, antenna uh, coming from this tag that provided location of, uh, of the bee eaters, but it also provided from these two small electrodes, the heart rate of the bird, which allow us to calculate the energy that the bird is actually spending while it is flying. And this is a crucial uh, issue, as you can uh, probably heard from uh, Franz Bialen talk, the amount of energy that the bird is expending during uh, its flight is crucial to its survival. And we are interested to understand how different environmental conditions affect bird metabolism, affect flight behavior, and ultimately the survival. So we use these uh, uh, small tags to uh, remotely uh, track birds in the field, and you can see that the birds do different things. They rest, and they fly in two different ways. They soar with their wings stretched, and they also flap when they cannot find any thermals, any uh, good uh, uh, convection. Uh, they are forced to, uh, to flap, and you can see here, you, for example, this spike, okay, is of a bird that started to, to flap its wings, and this bird that here uh, has a very low uh, um, heart rate soared all the way uh, many, many uh, minutes during its flight above the Negev uh, uh, desert. Um, so we are using this uh, information and combine this information with uh, laboratory measurements on the actual metabolic cost of, of, uh, of movement or of, 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 of life, and combining it with uh, uh, remotely uh, sensed um, uh, flight style. Okay, you can see here these are a wing flap recorded uh, uh, many kilometers away, and these are the typical uh, swiveling motion, the, the circling motion of birds within a thermal. So we can gather all this information in order to gain much better knowledge about what the birds are doing during migration. And we can summarize these, all this information and, and look at different behaviors. So when the bird is resting, the, uh, um, the heart rate of it is pretty low, as you may expect. And when it flaps its wings, either during stopover and during cross-country flight, the, the, uh, the uh, heartbeat is, is much higher. And the question was, what's going on during gliding? And we were able to uh, uh, track birds also during gliding and found that their uh, heart rate is, is very similar to when they are actually resting. So using hot air convection allowed them to actually rest while they are moving toward their destination. And this is something that is very critical for them as they need to go through the entire Sahara Desert and probably cannot feed, at least in large quantities. So saving energy is, is very important for them. And we are interested to know when they, are, when they can do it. And, and for this, uh, uh, we, 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 we wanted to predict the flight behavior and associated energy expenditure. And we did it by modeling the environmental condition using uh, the uh, regional atmospheric modeling system, uh, which is a numeric model that we applied to a, a specific section of bird migration. So it was a model that was applied regionally. And um, uh, this is just uh, an example. It, it models the, the atmosphere at, at different height and over different uh, uh, spatial uh, extent. And we found that the turbulence kinetic energy uh, at a height of 500 meters above ground is closely, so which is a, a measure of the um, a turbulence of the air associated with the convection of the air is strongly determining the flight style of the bird. 
So when the bird is soaring above the ground, it can do it only when there's a strong convection, as you may expect. And when no such convection is, is, is existing, the birds are forced to flap. And we can predict, probably in the scale of hours and maybe days, several days, not more than that, what might be the conditions for successful migration using soaring lighting as opposed to flapping flight. So uh, the insight from the bee eater study include that different flight behavior have different metabolic costs and that flight behavior depends on environmental conditions that are predictable, at least at some time scale, but environmental conditions may force birds to fly at non-optimal conditions, incurring high energy costs during migration. And with this in mind, I would like to focus now on a completely different system, at a completely different organism in a different um, continent. And this nice fellow, the straw-colored fruit bat, is also a flyer, and it needs to negotiate the atmosphere in a similar way as the, uh, um, the bee eaters, because these bats are commuting, which means that they roost in one place and they go off to feed in a completely different place. So they do it on a daily basis. They are not going for thousands of kilometers on a daily basis, but still they are going through a considerable distance in the air and they must negotiate the flow while they are doing it. So this nice uh, fellow has been equipped with, with this uh, GPS tag and, and the tags were equipped, uh, on, were attached to the, to the bats in the uh, colony and they were, the data was downloaded, were downloaded uh, from the bats when they returned back to the colony after a day and in many cases after many days uh, uh, of, of wild uh, uh, roaming. And um, this uh, bat, unlike the bee eater, knows only, it knows to fly in only one way. It knows only to flap its wing. It cannot soar. Okay, so uh, we uh, thought that using soaring related atmospheric variable will probably be meaningless. And we looked on specific parameters and specifically the wind as possible explanatory um, uh, parameters to explain flight behavior. So uh, this is a bat that is now uh, going back to its roost. This uh, uh, nice animation was prepared by uh, Nir Horvitz uh, from the Hebrew University. And you can see that using these uh, 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 tracking devices, we get very intimate details about what the bat is actually doing. It's different ground, and air speed, okay, the, the speed in relation to the air, the elevation, and the exact uh, 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 location of the back during its flight. And we tend, to, or some people tend to think of animals, bats, birds, and others as optimal uh, 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 creatures that do things very economically, or at least in most of the cases, but this is not always the case, as you will shortly see. This bat also does a bit of more crazy things, but they might be uh, meaningful. You can see here that it starts to move sideways, and, and this is something that is really untypical to most bats that we tracked, but it may have meanings for the uh, bat to sample its environment outside its known, very repeatable um, uh, commuting track. So you can see here that it did something uh, very strange. He is doing something very strange, but still it, it might be uh, meaningful. So these were the, the tracks uh, of the bat that we followed. We followed them in Ghana here. So this is Western Africa. Uh, and the bats were followed here in, in this uh, tropical area. This is the sea. And they were uh, 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 trapped and tracked near the Accra airport. And, and then 
the, the uh, tracking uh, devices told us that they were actually going off to forage at very specific locations, each bat at its own specific uh, location, and, and many bats returned to the same tree or, or group of trees night after night, and we were interested to understand what happened while they uh, were flying, and for that, we really needed to know what the wind, what was the effect of the wind on their flight. So you can see here the, uh, the sea breeze that uh, uh, around this area where the colony is located. We can see here spatial gradients and some gradients in time. And we were interested to see the influences using uh, uh, our, our modeling uh, uh, platform. And you can see here, for example, this is the starting point from the uh, colony to uh, uh, the, the feeding tree. And this uh, uh, is a, a roughly a 60 kilometer uh, long track that the bat is doing at, at a single night, flying over one hour continuously. And it, is, uh, it must negotiate quite a, a substantial wind at the beginning of, of its flight. Later on, the winds is, is really, are re really weak. And, and you can see here that uh, although it, it uh, uh, needs to negotiate these winds, the, the track of the bat is not much affected by these winds. They are not displacing their track when they are uh, 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 encountering these winds. So this means that they must, they must go against the wind in order to maintain their course. Okay, so they might have a metabolic cost or a cost in terms of the speed of flight in order to negotiate this flow. And this was the focus of our specific uh, uh, um, uh, investigation in which we uh, uh, compared theoretical expectation based on an optimal flight model that was outlined 20 years ago but has never been tested with empirical findings. So this is the, uh, uh, the, the model, the theoretical expectation. And, and you can see here that there is a, a very abrupt and, 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 and well-defined change to the behavior of these flying animals when the wind direction changes. So when the, the bats or the birds are uh, enjoying, uh, enjoying uh, uh, winds that come from the tail, supporting wind, they reduce their own speed. Okay, so here you can see that they reduce their own speed, but later on, when winds come from the side and ahead of them, they completely change their strategy, and instead of that, they increase their own speed. Okay, and I will not go into the details of how this was calculated, but this is a fairly uh, a straightforward expectation. And our study find that the, the bats are actually uh, doing that. They do change their behavior in a less extreme way, but here they, they tend to reduce their own speed and then they move to the different strategy as the wind uh, uh, direction changes. So this is a, a qualitative uh, support for this uh, optimal flight model that was uh, 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 outline quite many years ago, but still uh, I th we think that this is a very relevant model to explain how birds, bats, and maybe other flying animals respond to flow in the atmosphere. And from individual tracks, I would like to move and to speak about uh, a more uh, uh, a population level or, or large scale uh, um, investigation of, uh, of animals, and this is, uh, uh, as uh, Amnon uh, Ginati mentioned, um, part of uh, what Yossi and I are participating, which is the European Network for, for the Radar Surveillance of Animal Movement, the NRAM. So this is an animation of uh, five meteorological uh, uh, radars that are spread here in the Netherlands and, and Belgium. And from the echoes of these radars, 
one can calculate different parameters, such as uh, the altitude profile of migration, but also the speed and the direction and, and, and several other parameters. And uh, the, the environmental effects on the phenomena of, of bird migration as a whole is very dramatic. You can see here that there's a, a migration to the uh, northwest over uh, these countries. And, and this is the, an animation that was produced by a uh, judicial Moshaman Baranes group in the University of Amsterdam. This is a different day. The direction of movement is much more to the east and the movement is much more rapid. And this is only because wind condition has changed. From one day to the other, we can see that wind has very important effects on migration at a regional and maybe even a continental or a, a very uh, uh, expanded area. And we can also uh, take uh, um, information from local radars here in Israel and do a similar analysis. So this analysis has been carried out by uh, Nadav Harpazi, who started, who, who did a, a study with uh, Yossi Lasham. And, and this uh, uh, um, radar image is uh, from the, the Air Force meteorological uh, uh, data, uh, uh, data set, and, and it was obtained from uh, Oded Ovadia, who is here. And this is the radar location here in the Negev Highland, the Dead Sea, the border with Jordan and uh, with Egypt. And you can see here that there is a, a very small uh, a dark uh, uh, pink spot, which is strange. All these are, are mainly dust and other uh, reflections, other echoes of the radar. But here, quite far away from the radar, there's a very high reflectance uh, 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 location or point. And, and as it moves, you can see that it's actually moving in, uh, uh, in a direction that is compatible with the existence of, of, uh, of bird flock, okay? So it is moving uh, further to the north. You can see here, this is the spot, and it's moving further to the north. And Nadav has made a, a very uh, serious effort to document all these tiny spots that move in the area in order to, pre to, to, to produce uh, the actual tracks. So for example, this flock has been tracked well into Sinai and then crossed uh, this area until lost almost two hours later. And we can have this track of this particular uh, uh, flock and then take all the flocks that were tracked on the same day by the radar. Okay, so in this particular year, the uh, uh, 2007 spring, the radar worked for only about, I think, two weeks because of technical issues. And in these two weeks, it produced many different flocks that uh, we were able to be, uh, that were, were spotted in all this uh, area of the Negev. So we can use tools produced and, and develop by other people and do some local development of tools to make similar analysis of migration intensity and other properties in, in, in Israel. And another aspect of migration that we can uh, uh, extract from these radars are the intensity of emergence from stopover sites to the air, to migration. So we can see here, this is the uh, northeastern United States. They have many weather radar in this area. And you can see that the intense, there are intense uh, uh, emergence of, of echoes from particular habitat. These are the red ones. And, and, and there are uh, other uh, uh, that are, are less intense habitat and we can then go back and see which are the specific, these specific habitats in order to establish the relationship between the quality of the stopover habitat and the density of the migrants. And we can do that through the uh, network of, of radars, which is the vision, the vision that we were uh, trying to, to, to achieve 
at the moment uh, in Israel using the Air Force and possibly other uh, radars as well. And this connects to the NRAM uh, uh, idea or, or initiative to connect all the uh, weather radars in Europe together and to use them as a platform for, for surveillance of, of animals and also to try and mitigate different consequences of um, wind turbines and other threats to migrating animals. So we, we believe that we uh, uh, properly, to pre to pre properly predict uh, bird response to environmental change, we must focus on relevant mechanism, bird tracking technology, remote sensing and atmosphere modeling may substantially enhance our knowledge and whether radar data may facilitate long-term monitoring of marine migration over a large spatial extent, including bird stopover habitat relationships. Thank you very much.